Bonjour Bonjour à tous, bienvenue, bienvenue au Palais des Congrès pour ce Google Cloud Summit. Waouh On a beau dire, hein, quand on ne s'appelle pas Charles Aznavour ou Julio Iglesias, c'est quand même impressionnant, c'est très impressionnant. On est vraiment, vraiment ravis d'être aujourd'hui avec toute l'équipe Google au Palais des Congrès. Euh, J'ai eu la chance euh, de démarrer cette aventure chez Google il y a maintenant 7 ans. Euh, l'aventure Google Entreprise qui est devenue Google Cloud et j'ai toujours un petit souvenir ému sur euh, nos premiers séminaires, notre premier séminaire qu'on a fait euh, ici à Paris, c'était pas très loin en fait, c'était il y a à 500 mètres d'ici près de l'Étoile, dans un petit cinéma, un cinéma de quartier qui s'appelait le Mac Mahon et on avait 40 personnes, donc c'est vraiment un plaisir euh, de voir tout le chemin qu'on a parcouru ensemble euh, pour se retrouver aujourd'hui donc au Palais des Congrès, on attend euh, près de 3000 personnes dans la journée, donc il y aura beaucoup d'ateliers, de, de breakout sessions, euh, qui vont vous permettre de découvrir en fait euh, ce qu'on fait chez Google Cloud. Donc bienvenue, euh, merci, merci à tous nos clients euh, en particulier euh, d'être avec nous aujourd'hui, nous accompagner. Merci à tous nos partenaires également qui nous ont aidés à monter cette opération. Et il y a quelque chose dont je suis particulièrement heureux aujourd'hui, c'est qu'on a euh, près de 60% en fait de l'audience qui sont des développeurs euh, et donc beaucoup d'entre vous ont déjà démarré en fait cette aventure avec Google Cloud. Donc on a mis beaucoup de passion, d'énergie, vous allez voir beaucoup de speakers ce matin, mais surtout des, des personnes de notre équipe qui ont préparé ces ateliers, euh, une fois encore pour vous faire découvrir le cloud, mais aussi Google Cloud. Alors ça fait maintenant, comme je disais, sept ans euh, que j'ai euh, le plaisir de travailler chez Google, et il y a, quand vous travaillez chez Google, euh, il y a beaucoup de gens qui sont très inspirants. Moi, il y a des gens qui m'ont inspiré. Et euh, en particulier, j'étais pas plus tard qu'il y a deux, trois semaines, je participais à un événement majeur pour nous, qui était l'ouverture de notre data center à Francfort, à Francfort, pardon, à Francfort, pardon euh, sachant qu'on ouvre un data center par mois en ce moment. Et, et donc, j'étais avec euh, Urs Holtz. Pour ceux qui ne connaissent pas Urs, Urs, et euh, le huitième employé chez Google. En fait, il est arrivé en 1998, quand Larry et Sergey ont monté Google. Et Ours, c'est la personne qui a bâti cette infrastructure chez Google et, et qui l'a fait grandir pour l'amener là où elle est aujourd'hui en 2017. Et j'avais une petite conversation avec Ours, je lui disais, Ours, c'est quand même extrêmement impressionnant ce que tu as fait, c'est fantastique. Mais bon, ça fait quand même 19 ans que tu es chez Google. Qu'est-ce qui fait que tu es encore motivé le matin pour te lever et aller au bureau euh, Tu as déjà mis à l'abri sans doute ta famille pour les dix prochaines générations. Et, et Ours me disait, euh, il disait, tu sais Sébastien, bon, il y a beaucoup d'agitation autour du cloud, ça a démarré, maintenant euh, le monde entier est en train de se rendre compte que c'est une obligation, on ne peut plus se passer du cloud, il faut qu'on aille vers le cloud. Mais pour l'instant, il n'y a que, franchement, il n'y a que 5% en fait des workloads ou des entreprises qui sont passées sur le cloud. Donc c'est vrai que ces dernières années, on a fait un peu de lift and shift, on, est passé, euh, on a passé des workloads, euh, euh, des architectures on-premise euh, dans le cloud public et, et chez Google. Mais imagine ce qui va se passer dans trois ans, alors c'est peut-être dans quatre ans, c'est peut-être dans deux ans, c'est peut-être dans cinq ans, quand tout le monde, le marché, l'ensemble du marché va passer sur le cloud. Et il m'a dit, s'il y a une chose que je ne veux pas rater, c'est bien ça, quel que soit le nombre d'années que j'ai passé chez Google. Et c'est ce qui va se passer, c'est ce qui est en train de se passer, c'est absolument incroyable. Donc on est en train de bâtir l'infrastructure qui va permettre de digérer en fait cette énorme transformation et ce momentum qu'on qu est en train de découvrir aujourd'hui. Euh, la deuxième chose en fait, et comme j'étais encore avec Ours, et toujours pour l'ouverture de ce data center à Francfort, on a eu l'occasion de rencontrer de nombreux analystes euh, et donc de s'asseoir avec eux. Et les analystes nous disaient, premièrement, extrêmement encourageant, ils disaient, écoutez, on vous aime bien comme Google, euh, parce qu'il y a vraiment quelque chose que vous faites extrêmement bien, c'est que vous êtes très ouvert, c'est-à-dire que euh, toute, toute votre, votre plateforme est non seulement très open, euh, mais aussi très accessible, et, et vous avez aussi toutes ces technologies d'orchestration qui permettent, en fait, de travailler avec l'ensemble des différentes technologies, qu'elles soient on-premise ou que ce soit des technologies du cloud, et pas forcément des technologies de Google. Mais maintenant, dites-moi un peu, ben, parlez un peu plus de vos, de vos différenciateurs, de votre stratégie, et, euh, et de revenir vraiment à des discussions du type, qu'est-ce qui va vraiment vous différencier Parce que euh, vous n'êtes pas forcément le leader aujourd'hui sur le marché, euh, on comprend que ça devient stratégique pour cette société Google, et ça l'est, on a fait 30 milliards de dollars d'investissement sur les trois dernières années autour de, de, du cloud et de Google Cloud en particulier. 
Mais qu'est-ce qui va vraiment vous différencier Au bout du compte, vous allez recruter des gens, vous allez euh, euh, former des équipes, vous allez euh, identifier euh, des, euh, des comptes, euh, vous allez travailler sur les mêmes comptes que vos deux autres concurrents. Et qu'est-ce qui va vraiment faire la différence et je trouve que Ours a fait une analogie qui peut paraître un peu standard et bateau, mais qui est très très vraie. Et euh, il nous a dit, écoutez, prenez vos montres, retardez-les d'une dizaine d'années, on n'est plus en 2017, on est en 2007. Et prenez un autre marché, qui est le marché de la téléphonie mobile. 2007, si vous pensez au marché de la téléphonie mobile, il y avait deux acteurs dominants, deux. On utilisait tous, pour ceux qui étaient là, et on était tous là, euh, soit un téléphone Nokia, un feature phone, soit un téléphone Blackberry, euh, dans le domaine de l'entreprise. Personne ne parlait d'Android, personne ne parlait d'Apple. C'est arrivé seulement en 2008, en fait, donc ça tombe parfaitement sur les dix années. Et vous avez l'analogie, en fait, c'est-à-dire que ce marché a été complètement replatformé, si je puis dire ça, et, et, et dix ans plus tard, on est en 2017, et je pense que l'analogie est très très forte, parce qu'en 2017, on est au début du cloud, il peut y avoir quelques acteurs qui sont déjà relativement dominants parce qu'ils ont démarré avant tout le monde, et c'est bien, et c'est vraiment super, et on a beaucoup de respect pour ça, mais on pense très sincèrement, très sincèrement, que ce qui va se passer dans les trois à cinq prochaines années va être totalement différent de ce qui s'est passé sur, par, sur, sur les trois ou cinq dernières années. Et les trois, cinq dernières années, on a commencé, une fois encore, comme je disais, à vraiment prendre des workloads dans le prémisse et à les mettre dans le cloud. Mais je ne suis pas sûr que ça soit aujourd'hui encore suffisamment transformatif ou que ça réponde aux besoins des entreprises et des dirigeants de ces entreprises et du business, dont les besoins et les discussions que l'on a avec ces, 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 ces exécutifs tournent beaucoup plus autour de la transformation digitale et bien plus autour du business et de l'innovation qu'il faut mettre en place pour, évidemment, capturer euh, des nouveaux clients, euh, pour lancer des nouveaux services, pour lancer des nouveaux produits. Donc, c'est ce qui va vraiment guider, en fait, l'accélération du cloud. Et on va beaucoup plus parler de machine learning, d'intelligence artificielle, de containerisation, euh, d'orchestration, en fait, de ces différents environnements, euh, et une fois encore, de plateformes euh, et de smart APIs autour de l'intelligence artificielle, que du simple lift and shift entre des environnements de prémisse vers des environnements cloud. Et donc c'est ça vraiment qui nous motive chez Google Cloud, c'est d'apporter ces nouvelles technologies. Et, et très honnêtement, on voit une réception fantastique en fait euh, de la part des entreprises et, et depuis en particulier ces 18 derniers mois. Et c'est ce qu'on voit ce matin. Alors la deuxième personne évidemment qui m'a beaucoup inspiré euh, chez Google, c'est Larry, Larry Page. Et, et c'est extrêmement connecté avec ce qu'on veut faire chez Google Cloud. On a évidemment une certaine, on a des principes en matière de culture chez Google, et il me faudrait une demi-heure pour en parler, mais il y en a un qui est très important, c'est que Larry a constaté depuis la création de Google que ce qui fait la différence entre une société qui réussit et une société qui ne réussit pas, qui échoue, c'est celles qui sont vraiment tournées vers le futur. Et il a toujours ce, cette espèce de principe qui vise à dire euh, on ne peut pas gérer notre business de façon incrémentale, il faut toujours avoir ce 10x thinking qui nous permet vraiment de réfléchir à ce qui va dérouter, changer, transformer notre industrie. Et on a toujours dirigé en fait euh, notre société de cette façon-là, et l'ensemble aujourd'hui des discussions qu'on peut avoir une fois encore, et des groupes qui nous rejoignent, qui travaillent avec Google Cloud, euh, tournent autour de cette transformation numérique, mais aussi de ces big bets, de ces paris en fait, et de la façon et de la possibilité Google en tant que société de les accompagner. Voilà, donc je voulais ouvrir en fait là-dessus, en matière un peu de réflexion sur euh, euh, le momentum, sur euh, l'évolution du cloud, et, et, et peut-être c'est un teaser, c'est ce qu'on va voir aujourd'hui euh, dans l'ensemble, euh, soit au niveau des keynotes, soit au niveau donc, des breakout sessions. J'aimerais, euh, avant de, de poursuivre, remercier donc euh, d'une part nos clients, vous en voyez quelques-uns ici, euh, c est, c est, c est, c est, une fois encore, c'est absolument fascinant, on travaille avec euh, l'ensemble des différentes industries. Alors il est vrai que vous allez rencontrer euh, sur ce slide, et c'est qu'un extrait, des entreprises en fait qui sont très data-driven, tout le monde est data-driven bien sûr, mais en particulier ces entreprises qui gèrent un volume de données extrêmement important et qui sont perturbées euh, justement par l'arrivée de ces nouvelles technologies, donc sont pionnières et on va en voir certaines aujourd'hui, que je remercie par avance, on va avoir des témoignages extrêmement intéressants. Et puis également, je remercie donc tous nos partenaires, mais au-delà de les remercier, je crois que c'est quelque chose qui est très important. Google a souvent eu la réputation d'être une entreprise grand public, 
Et c'est vrai que depuis quelques années, on a fait des investissements très importants pour pouvoir apporter le niveau et la qualité de service requis pour travailler avec des grandes, avec des grandes entreprises. Et au-delà en fait, de recruter énormément de profils techniques pour vous aider à migrer vos applications, à développer vos nouveaux projets, on a aussi bâti un écosystème partenaire qui est absolument primordial, que ce soit des systèmes intégrateurs qui sont représentés aujourd'hui dans la salle, qui nous aident à monter cet événement, que ce soit des grands cabinets d'audit et de conseil, ou que ce soit aussi des partenaires technologiques dont vous retrouvez certains dans cette liste et dont on aussi bâti des relations de partenariat avec des entreprises avec lesquelles vous travaillez au quotidien, comme SAP, dont on a fait des, des annonces récemment. Voilà, donc il me reste à vous souhaiter une excellente journée. Une fois encore, on est vraiment heureux, fiers, très excités en fait, de vous accueillir, euh, d'avoir monté ce programme. Et sans plus attendre, je vais euh, accueillir le prochain speaker. Uh, and switch into English to please welcome Ulku Rao. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here in Paris, city of lights, La Ville Lumière. When I was getting ready to come here from New York, I wondered how Paris got that name, so I googled. I found out two things. The first is, did you know that in 1860s, there were 56,000 gas lamps illuminating the streets and boulevards of Paris. The second one reason is even more interesting. Paris got its name, the City of Lights, because of the role that it played in the 18th century in the Age of Enlightenment. So I can't think of a better place to be, to be talking about the next set of revolutions that will bring in a different age of enlightenment, the age of innovation and digital transformation. Now, we're living in exciting times. It's a time of enormous change. This is, we're living through change in our lives, in our society, and in business. And all of this is happening at an unprecedented pace. Now, one of the places that we can see this change is in the Fortune 500. The Fortune 500 was first set up in 1955 with an initial set of 500 companies. Only 60 years later, in 2014, only 61 of those companies remain. Now, if you are one of the 439, that is a pretty scary statistic. And, um, from that very first 500 companies, nobody remembers, unless you're a car enthusiast, the American car maker, Studebaker. But we have welcomed Tesla. We don't remember Collins Radio, but Netflix is here. Companies are going out of business, companies are being acquired, and new companies are coming in. And it's happening faster and faster every day. So what is driving all this change? What's happening? What is the difference between organizations that fail and those that thrive? And of course, the answer is technology. Technology is everywhere. And um, this intersection of various technology trends, cloud and mobile and social and IoT and big data and machine learning, are having a profound impact on our lives and our, on our businesses. Now, before I came to Google, I had um, a pretty long career in financial services. And we had, a, um, we had a very simple mission. You know, we were building systems to enable efficient, frictionless, safe and sound financial markets. Unfortunately, though, doing that meant we had to spend an inordinate amount of time on things like hardware procurement and supply chain management and network setup and databases and software upgrades. Now, cloud enables you to change that. It enables you to focus on technology that differentiates your business and defocus technology that does not. 
And it doesn't end with cloud. With now, with mobile and social, businesses can reach their customers no matter where they are on the planet. And it's not just people, devices as well with IoT, Internet of Things. And all these interactions are now creating data that can be processed with big data and machine learning to turn into insights and engagement models with our customers that we were never able to do before. And this is available to everyone, no matter how large or how small. So it is no longer about big versus small. Now it's about the fast versus the slow. Companies need to be faster. They need to be faster identifying customer trends, and they need to be faster at responding to market. They need to be faster at decision making. They need to be faster at everything. Change is going to come. The question is, are you going to be an agent of it, or are you going to be a casualty? Now, the way to deal with that change is, of course, again, through technology. At Google, we believe that every company, regardless of its size or industry, will differentiate themselves through technology. And all of that is centered on data. So we believe that every company is or will become a technology company. Uh, and in this world, your engineering talent is your only sustainable advantage. So I've been a New Yorker for 20 years, um, but I'm originally from Turkey. When I was growing up in Turkey, your, uh, the quality of your public transportation kind of depended on your proximity to your fellow passengers. So if, if you didn't have money, you know, buses were super cheap. But man, they were packed like sardines. And if you had a little bit more money, you could get a cab where you could have the whole car to yourself except now you are at the mercy of your driver. And I am convinced that every single driver in Turkey thinks they're a Formula One driver, except, you know, the safety and the security. And in between these two things, we had what we called dolmush. The literal translation of that word means stuffed. It means stuffed. So these are smaller cars, usually like sedans or minivans. And uh, they don't have fixed stops, but they have fixed routes. And if you want to get on one, you hail one, and they stop. And if they have room to stuff one person in, another person in, you get in. Uh, so because it's a smaller car, they're limited by how many people they can stuff by the number of their seats. So it's only marginally you know, more expensive than the bus, but it is kind of much better than um, much better than the, the experience is much better than the bus. So that was ride sharing 1.0, the Turkish way. Now today we're, we're sharing, we're experiencing ride sharing 2.0, the global way. Ride sharing companies are completely transforming the transportation industry all over the world. They are using technology to completely undermine the principles or the assumptions that the previous business model was predicated upon. And it's not just the app that allows you to hail the car and then know where the car is and the driver finds you. It's also things like you know, availability of the GPS and maps and voice, which means that the driver doesn't have to memorize every road and every point of interest that everybody might want to know. And it's about being able to give feedback so that you can get a sense of the credibility of the driver so you're not at the, at the mercy of the Formula One drivers in Istanbul. And uh, so this is all has changed completely how transportation works. And it doesn't mean that Uber or Lyft will be the winners. It just means that that industry has been completely changed and it will never be the same again. And most likely, the next set of disruption in that industry is going to be the self-driving cars, where you won't even need that cab driver. This is what we call digital transformation. And it's not doing things just a little bit better. It is doing things differently. It is about doing different things. Now, the question that you should be asking here today is, 
What does your digital transformation look like? What is that journey like for you? And, and that journey is not to the cloud. Cloud is not a destination. Cloud is a vehicle that gets you to your digital transformation. Now, as you ask that question, there are four things that you need to think about. The first is optimization. How do you optimize your IT operations? How do you get out of the business of delivering technology that doesn't differentiate your business? Now, we say, make it our problem. Because you know what? Delivering infrastructure, infrastructure and platforms at extreme scale with great reliability and performance and with trust and security is what we do best here at Google. Second is um, collaboration. How do we help you create an environment in your own shops uh, that, that promotes innovation? And how do we create an environment where the sum is uh, greater than the, sum, the, the, the whole is greater than the sum of the pieces? And it's not just about making things a little bit faster and a little bit better. It's about doing things differently. It's about doing different things. Then we're going to talk about acceleration. How can we help, your biz help you accelerate your business with data and machine learning? And finally, we're going to talk about partnering. Because that journey to your digital transformation doesn't have to be one that you walk alone. That partnership starts with openness for us. And it's more than just open source. It's about flexible architectures and flexible and uh, customer-friendly uh, costing structures. Now, we, how can we take everything that makes Google great and share that with you and go beyond that? How do we co-invest in the success of your business with you? We'll talk about that. And at Google, it is not about just the infrastructure. It's about the collaboration platforms. It's about being able to run your applications safe and securely. And it's about data and analytics. And it's about machine learning. So during the course of today's presentations, we are going to share with you our thoughts on what that digital transformation journey looks like and the various way stations in it. So let's start with optimization. Well, congratulations. You have made the decision to move to the cloud. You've made the decision to adopt a technology platform that enables you to focus on what's important for your business, to be more efficient, to collaborate better, to innovate faster, be more agile, be more responsive. Now, how do you pick your cloud provider? What factors? help you determine who is going to be the best partner in that digital transformation. Now, in my role, I get to talk to a lot of C-level executives and IT professionals like you. And here is what they told me. Here is what you told me. You said, it's about reliability. It's about security, excellent support, performance, and cost effectiveness in that order. You pick these because cloud infrastructure is not a commodity. Because the quality of the infrastructure that you are going to build your business on matters. It makes a big difference. And these are the things that actually differentiates us at Google. Our ability to run at planet scale with great reliability and performance, with trust and security, with excellent partnership, and good price. We have been building and operating a planet-scale cloud for a very long time. Now, over the years, we built seven platforms with over 1 billion users each. Anyone recognize those logos? Raise your hand if you have used any of these products for me. Raise your hand. All right, raise your hand. All right, keep your hand up if you use them today. Yeah, and keep your hand up if you've used them since I started talking. All right. All right, I appreciate the honesty. Thank you for being customers. But as we did that, uh, along the way, we learned quite a bit about running a cloud at scale. And you know, we learned about security and reliability and efficiency and you know, all, the, all the experiences uh, that you enjoy about Google already. 
And it is that same infrastructure and expertise that we now offer to our GCP clients. So they can run their businesses at scale with reliability and security. And now today, our GCP clients are serving their over 1 billion users on GCP. All right, so how does Google build reliable systems? How do we do it? It's not just one thing, it's many things. It's about how we do data centers, it's how we think about networking, it's about you know, how we build and deploy software. We built um, SRE, our Site Reliability Engineering Practice, years ago to be able to run ultra-scalable and reliable systems. And our engineers, over time, have come up with new paradigms on how to run these large systems. And they became with new ways of introducing change at high velocity without compromising from reliability or performance. So we literally did write the book on it. You know, we took all our experiences and we, we put it together and we published it on our website and it's free and available for everyone. And it is that same experience that we are now offering our customers with our customer reliability engineering practice, where we take our experiences, our methods, and our frameworks, and now we share them with you. What's better than reliability? It's reliability that doesn't come with a high price tag. Indeed, for dollar for dollar, GCP provides better performance value than any other cloud provider in the market. This is from Cloud Spectator's independent benchmarking study that was published earlier this summer. And a key part of delivering that performance is our global premium network. We run and operate the world's largest IP data network. We have dark and light, light fiber across every continent on the planet, except for Antarctica. We have uh, undersea cables across the Atlantic and the Pacific. And our data centers don't connect to just each other like some competing clouds do. Our data centers connect to every single ISP in the world. Today, about 40% of the world's entire internet traffic goes through our network. And we recently introduced a premium network in addition to our already super ultra-fast standard network. If you need it, it's about 70% more performant. Now, we pay incredible amount of attention to the quality and the reach of our network. Why do we do that? We do that because if you are a business with customers all over the planet, their performance and your reliability of that network is going to be important to you. The other reason we do this is for security. Remember we talked about the five factors at the beginning that was important, you know, security was number two. The, the reality is the fewer public internet transit points you have in your network, the less likely are you going to get cyber attacks because you'll be eliminating things like man in the middle, traffic profiling and shaping, and surveillance. A network you control end to end is inherently safer. At Google, our ability to deliver security at scale is what differentiates us. Now, it used to be that security was the reason people didn't move to the cloud. Today, security is the reason to move to the cloud. We believe in defense in depth. That means that we embed security at every layer of our stack. We custom design and build our servers and networking equipment. We eliminate any unnecessary parts that would create additional vulnerabilities. We run proprietary and hardened operating systems. And we run software stacks that we constantly test and fix for vulnerabilities. Now, um, above all of this, we believe in a very simple philosophy. We trust nothing. We believe that if anything can fail or can be compromised, it will fail and it will get compromised. How far do we take this philosophy? Let me introduce you to Titan. Titan is a custom chip designed by Google. We put it on all our new servers. and. 
hardware, into network cards and our devices. It allows us to protect the identity of our machines by establishing a hardware root of trust. It helps us authenticate the hardware and protects against tampering at the hardware, BIOS, and services level. Now, in Greek mythology, titans were these big giants of incredible strength. Well, Titan packs all of that in this tiny little chip. The Titan chip that you see up there is smaller than my fingernail on my pinky. Now, if you are in the audience today and you are in one of the regulated industries, you're in financial services or you're in healthcare or another industry, you're saying, all right, this is great, it's awesome, but how about compliance? How can Google help us with that? Well, it is very important to us to help our clients be able to use our systems and sources no matter which industry or geography they sit on. So every year we go through dozens and dozens of independent verifications of our security, privacy, and compliance controls. Some examples of them are up here on the screen, like our SOC and ISO certifications, our PCI compliance, and, um, and uh, Privacy Shield. Now, in addition to these global certifications, we also provide local certifications in individual countries. As I said, we're committed to helping our customers meet their regulatory and policy demands no matter where they are. Another example of this is the upcoming European Global Data Protection Regulation, GDPR. And we are fully committed to be complying with it by the time it goes into effect, May of 2018. We are constantly innovating in our quest to find better ways to help you secure your business. So today I'm going to highlight two. The first one is Identity Aware Proxy. Remember how I said we don't trust anything? One of the things we don't trust is corporate networks and VPNs. Now, traditional security relies on VPNs and firewalls. Now, the problem with that, if once a bad actor gets in, they can do a lot of damage. So instead, we offer identity-aware proxy, which enables you to enforce who gets access to what, at the application layer, not with remote access VPNs and firewalls. The second one I want to highlight today is our Data Loss Prevention API. Data Loss Prevention API lets you discover PII and other sensitive data and give you an option to be able to redact or anonymize it. Now, to show us some of this innovation in action, I'd like to call up Frances Campoy to show us the power of DLP API. Merci beaucoup, Oku, et bonjour tout le monde. Alors, euh, je vais montrer juste euh, deux exemples de quelque chose qu'on a, euh, a construit sur la Data Loss Pre uh, Prevention API. Tout d'abord, je ne sais pas si vous avez jamais utilisé Slack. Si vous ne l'avez jamais pas utilisé, c'est un système de chat que les hipsters aiment. Et ce qu'on va faire, c'est qu'on va utiliser... Ça, c'est Slack pour de vrai, d'ailleurs. C'est le vrai Slack. <rire> c'est pas... Euh, par contre, on va voir une fausse conversation. Et pendant cette conversation, en fait, on a une équipe de ressources humaines qui est en train d'essayer de euh, faire le onboarding de plusieurs employés. Et pour, pour faire cela, ils sont en train de partager plein d'infos. Il euh, y a une partie de cette information qui est bien. Donc, par exemple, on a vu tout au début une carte sociale, euh, de la sécurité sociale américaine. Ce que j'ai découvert quand j'ai déménagé aux États-Unis, c'est quelque chose de très important, il ne faut jamais perdre. Euh, je ne sais pas où c'est la mienne, mais ça, ce n'est pas important. <rire> mais ça, c'est un document qui euh, identifie personnellement et qu'on veut utiliser. Donc ça, c'est bien. Par contre, on a aussi passé d'autres informations qu'on ne voudrait pas avoir. Donc, par exemple, on a des numéros de téléphone, on a des emails, on a des cartes de crédit, euh, on a des photos des cartes de crédit, parce que pourquoi pas, et même euh, des permis de conduire. Tout ça, en fait, ça va contre nos, notre, nos politiques de privacité. Donc, si on laissait cette conversation telle qu'elle, 
on aurait un problème. Euh, on serait en violation de plusieurs politiques de privacité, ce qui poserait des problèmes légaux. Donc, en fait, juste en utilisant euh, la euh, Data Loss Prevention API et euh, ce qui est juste des, des appels REST, donc c'est super simple. Et puis, on, on, avec euh, les, les, des librairies pour euh, construire des bots sur euh, Slack, on a créé ce petit bot qui nous permet de faire DLP clean. Quand on exécute ça, toutes les parties qui sont considérées euh, inacceptables par nos, nos, politiques, nos politiques de sécurité vont disparaître. Donc, en fait, on a vu qu'il y a toutes les photos qui sont disparues. Donc, euh, on a aussi enlevé des cartes de crédit, on a enlevé des emails, mais par contre, on a gardé notre carte de, so de sécurité sociale parce que celle-là, c'était dans nos politiques. Donc, ça, c'est quelque chose qu'on a construit et en fait, on veut que vous l'essayez. Donc, si vous voulez l'essayer euh, d'une façon gratuite pour une durée limitée, vous n'avez que m'envoyer un tweet sur Francesc. Voilà. Et maintenant, on a une deuxième partie de la démo. C'est juste pour montrer que ceci n'est pas que sur Slack. Euh, Slack, c'est très bien, mais si vous voulez construire quelque chose sur vos plateformes, vous pouvez aussi le faire. Donc, pour cela, on a construit cette petite page web. Euh, ça, c'est une caméra et ça, c'est mes doigts. Donc, c'est pour de vrai. Et on peut filtrer. Il y a plein de choses qu'on peut filtrer. Euh, donc, on va dire, on va filtrer des cartes de crédit, on va filtrer des euh, permis de conduire, des visages. Vous pouvez aussi choisir des documents par pays. Donc, par exemple, pour la France, vous avez des passeports et d'autres documents. Donc, je prends une photo. Et voyons ce que ça a marché. Oh, le Wi-Fi. <rire> Attends. Bon. On va, on va faire semblant que ça a marché, parce que le Wi-Fi ne marche plus. Mais en fait, pour cette, pour cette euh, photo, ce ne marcherait pas de toute façon, parce qu'en en fait, on reconnaît pas seulement que le numéro, mais aussi on voit que ce numéro-là n'est pas une carte de crédit euh, valable. Donc en fait, je vais essayer de faire refresh. C'est... Oups Salut <rire> Voilà. En fait, on ne l'a pas enlevé, parce que ce n'est pas un numéro de carte vraie de euh, valable. Par contre, si on prend celui-là, qui est exactement le même, mais avec un numéro différent à la fin, ça par contre, c'est un numéro de, euh, de carte de crédit qui est valable. Il n'y a pas d'argent derrière, donc pas besoin de prendre une photo. Et voilà, maintenant ici, on l'enlève. Et... Allez. <rire> Et pour finir, j'aurai besoin de Hulku pour la dernière partie de la, euh, de la démo. On va montrer que ça, ça marche pas seulement que sur des documents. Ça marche sur les documents les plus importants. C'est des selfies. Et... Non <rire> Non Encore une fois. Oh, at attention. Des visages. J'avais enlevé ça. C'est une vraie démon, vous voyez. <rire> voilà, merci. Thank you. Thanks, Francesc, for that um, wonderful demo. Now, DLP is just one of the examples of how we help you secure your businesses. Now, our security capabilities don't just end with infrastructure. They go into our collaboration platforms and extend all the way up to our um, endpoints and access platforms. Our global scale access Uh, across the enterprise and our consumer gives us unprecedented visibility to, to threats. So let me give you an example. In Gmail, over 1 billion users that we have in Gmail, every minute we filter out 10 million spam messages. And we are able to do that with 99% accuracy thanks to our machine learning models. For our Chrome users, we warn them of Uh, of suspected malware 992 times a minute. And we notify them of potentially unwanted software 6,000 times. For our Android users, we check the health of 400 million devices daily. And for 6 billion mobile apps, we check them to make sure they're not infected. We protect 2 billion mobile phones, tablets, and other devices that use Google's safe browsing technology. 
For, the, for our GCP clients, this means end-to-end -end security, all the way from infrastructure to endpoints and access platforms. Now, infrastructure provides the foundation of your business. And with the right cloud partner, you can optimize your infrastructure and make it more reliable, more secure, and most connected. Now, once you've done that, we can help you accelerate that path to innovation. And to continue the discussion into about this new age of enlightenment, the age of innovation and transformation, I would love to call on stage one of my collaborators, David Thacker, to talk about collaboration. Welcome on stage, David. <laughs> Thank you, Uku, for the introduction. Uh, good morning, bonjour. It's great to be in Paris. Thank you for coming today. My name is David Thacker. I'm a vice president of product management at Google. I'm responsible for our G Suite products, and I'm based in our Silicon Valley headquarters in California. Today, I'm going to talk about G Suite and how it can transform the way your company works, making it much more collaboration, collaborative. <clears throat> so when we think about the world and we think about the major achievements and whether it's business or architecture or engineering, collaboration's always been a central part of that. So I was looking today uh, for an example to highlight that's relevant to France and to Paris. So I want to talk about the Eiffel Tower and the collaboration that went into making the structure. I think a lot of people believe, such as myself, I had thought that Gustav Eiffel was a genius that designed and created the Eiffel Tower himself. But when you study the history, it's actually much more complex. The Eiffel Tower, the original sketch that you see behind me, was developed by two structural engineers working together. In fact, this sketch was developed by one of them while he was working at home. So the next time your boss tells you you can't work from home, just remind them that sometimes your most creative uh, elements come out when you're working at home, away from the office. They brought this sketch into their office, and they reviewed it with a few other people, including their head of architecture. The head of architecture at their firm said, this is a great structure, but we need to make it uh, much better. And so he added his, his insight. Um, and as a result, they developed some other embellishments, such as the decorative arches you see at the bottom of the Eiffel Tower, or the glass uh, observatory that you see on the first floor. They then took this to Gustav Eiffel, who acquired the patent, and with a team of 300 people, came up with the final designs and constructed the building over the course of two years. The final achievement was the tallest man-made structure in the world at the time, in 1889, and we'd certainly today think of it as a masterpiece. Now, although that was 130 years ago, when you think about the world of business today in the year 2017, whether your business is creating life-saving medicines or running a global shipping company or advancing telecommunications, creating electric cars, all these achievements would not be possible without the collaborative efforts of your employees working together. And employees today want the best tools to work together so they can work more quickly, so they can be more productive, and so they can focus on maximizing their creative output. In fact, employees that have the best tools are happier overall. And so that's really why we created G Suite. G Suite is our collection of products to maximize a company's creative output, to make employees more collaborative. Now, in creating G Suite, our productivity solution, we took the best of our consumer products, the ease of use, the intuitive design, the scalability, the intelligence built into the products, and we combined that with a world-class set of enterprise features around scalability, performance, cost-effectiveness. And together, we've created a very compelling solution for companies. But before I talk about the product, I first want to talk about some research we do and this statistic 5%. So we did a lot of internal research and external research at Google, user studies, look at the modern office worker, the modern professional, to see how they spend their time. And the results were pretty shocking. So the typical modern office place worker today spends only 5% of their time on creative work and strategic work. The other 95% of their time is spent on more mundane activities that get in the way of this other work. This can include searching for files and searching for information, trying to find the right person in your company to get a hold of, to get the, the right answer to a question. It can involve things like trying to set up a meeting to get people together in the same room or even trying to join an audio conference or video conferencing meeting uh, and worrying about codes. There are lots of small things that get in the way of the average employee's typical workday. Here's another example. 
in a lot of companies today, this is the way that companies collaborate around documents, whether they're creating a, a slide or a presentation. A team may have many individuals, all with numerous files on their desktop for the same file, slightly different versions, emailing large attachments back and forth, trying to stay on the same page, with the end result of trying to create that final, final version that they can present. This isn't a great way of working, and it's not very efficient. When you look at how a G Suite customer operates, collaboration is central. In Google Docs, one of our most popular features today, and we launched this 10 years ago, is the ability to collaborate in real time. So you can have a set of multiple editors and authors all working on a document, whether it's from their laptop or whether it's from their mobile device. They can edit in real time, and they can see the changes as they happen. If they have comments, if they have questions, this can all be addressed in real time, making the process much, much faster. We pioneered this, and we've continued to extend this collaboration throughout our products. Another example is our Team Drive feature, which we launched earlier this year. So Drive is our cloud-based storage solution, and we created the concept of a team. So now in Drive, you can set up a folder or a shared workspace for your team where you can store all the files and information related to that team. So now, every member of your team always has access to the latest files. They can collaborate on all these files in real time. It doesn't matter whether they're on the go or whether they're in the office, they have access to this data. We've combined this with our enterprise feature set, such that Google Vault, for e-discovery and compliance. And there's some great security features built in. Because the files belong to the team, if a member leaves a team or someone leaves a company, a team member leaves a company, you can revoke access to these files. But all the files stay owned with the team. So the rest of the employees that are left behind on the team can continue working at the same pace. Another example of collaboration in G Suite is our Hangouts Meet video conferencing solution. Video con conferencing is integrated seamlessly into, into G Suite. So it's very easy to set up a meeting that has video conferencing support. And whether an employee wants to, jo to join from their mobile device, whether they want to join from the laptop, or whether they're in a meeting room with access to video conferencing hardware, with one click, they're seamlessly added to the meeting. Now at Google, we see a big trend where the future of meetings is video conference, uh, moving away from audio conference. And there's been some academic research that's looked at audio conferences in the workplace environment. And they found that people that join in or are simply participating via phone are a lot less engaged in the meeting. They're much more likely to be multitasking. And they're a lot less likely to participate. With video conferencing, that changes dramatically. People are more engaged. Humans have a natural instinct to want to work face to face with individuals. So it doesn't matter whether you're in different time zones or different audiences, offices, you can seamlessly collaborate through video conferencing. Now that's collaboration. I now want to turn your attention to machine learning and artificial intelligence and how that can impact the productivity suite. So at Google, we have a huge focus on machine learning and, and AI and building that into our products. We want to create magical product experiences throughout G Suite. Our focus is to automate and let machines take care of the mundane and the, the mindless tasks and let humans really focus on that creative work. So we want to automate this 95% of stuff that gets in the way of employees doing their best work. And I'm going to show you some examples of how that works throughout the products. But Google's uniquely positioned to focus on AI due to our infrastructure, which you heard about earlier today. We have a world-class set of data scientists and machine learning experts at Google. And finally, we have a massive amount of data that we can use to train our models. So let's see how machine learning works in the product today. A simple example is Drive Quick Access. So in our Drive product, when someone comes into the product for the first time, or they're typically looking to find a file. And it used to be you'd have to search to find that file. Well, we created this feature, Quick Access, where now when you, when you come into Drive, you'll see a set of five suggested files. These are files we predict you may want to open. And we look at a variety of different signals. We look at the time of day it is. We look at what meeting you are in, based on what's on your calendar. We look at who you've been collaborating with recently on email or instant messaging. And using all these various signals, our models will predict which file you want to open. Now, this saves users a lot of time, and it's very accurate. Over 40% of our files today in Drive are open through this quick access feature. And that number keeps going up as our models get better and better. So a user on a mobile device that's trying to find that file quickly can find it right away and with one click start viewing it. Really powerful. 
Another example of machine learning in our products is the Gmail smart reply features. Some of you may have seen this before, but now in Gmail on your mobile device, when you receive an incoming email, we'll use artificial intelligence to suggest three possible responses for you for that email. Our studies show that a lot of email communication today is short form in nature and can be addressed with such a solution. So in this example you see behind me, a colleague of mine has emailed me and asked me if I've looked at the latest log files to analyze them. With one click, I can say, yes, I'm working on it, and get back to them. Again, these are small things, but they add up over the course of the day and can save users a lot of time, especially in that mobile use case when you're on the go and it's much more difficult to type an answer. And this model gets better and better as we have more data and more usage of the product. The third example I want to give today is for our Sheets product, which is our cloud-based spreadsheet solution. We launched a feature last year called Explore in Sheets. Now, spreadsheets are the most common way employees in your enterprise will access data. And our studies have found that a third of your employees aren't familiar with formulas or don't really know how to use formulas in spreadsheets. So it's very difficult for them to get insights into the data. So with our Explore feature, we made it easy for anyone to get data and insights from their spreadsheet. And the way we do that is through nat natural language processing, where a user can simply ask questions of the data, and we'll show them the answers. So rather than explain this, I think the best way is to see it. So I'd like to invite my colleague, Robert Kubis, on stage to give you a demonstration of this feature. Robert? Thank you, David. Bonjour. Je n'ai parlé pas français, so I will switch to English as well. Um, I assume everybody has seen one of those, a spreadsheet in one form of the, or the other. And tabular, tabular tables are really, really powerful format to structure your data. Now, so it sounds maybe a little scary, but it's no surprise to you that most companies are actually relying on these kinds of data. But only, as David mentioned already, only about 30% feel comfortable to get insights out of their spreadsheet by using formulas, charts, and things like that. So to enable more users to get insights, actions, and charts out of their spreadsheets, we enabled the Explore, or we added the Explore button to Sheets. So when I click here, some magic is happening behind the scenes, and we give you some actions and insights on the right side, as you can see here. So we can see, uh, for instance, for every increase of 100 euro in revenue, we, our profit increases by 68.5 euros. So that's pretty nice. Um, as you can see, the uh, spreadsheet is about dessert sales. So let's see if we can find a nice chart. I think the pie chart here is probably pretty appropriate for, uh, for desserts. So what we can do is we can just with one click add this chart uh, into our spreadsheet. Now imagine what you would have to do if you would have to go to the menu, select the chart, find the appropriate chart, select the columns that you want to display in this chart. So you can see that this just saved you a whole lot of time. Now, if you don't find the answer that you're looking for, you can actually use natural language processing to see like what, what data is in my spreadsheet. So what I want to see here is I want to look for the top items sold in, in FAB. And as you can see here, we have um, some answers. It gives us also a formula. And I'm not the most proficient in, in cheats, but I probably could, f could have figured this formula out with like, my favorite search engine and looking how I can find like, and uh, do this calculation. But it would have taken me quite some time again and probably some errors along the way. So here you just type in your question and you get the formula uh, presented to you and can use it. Now, let's look at something else. Um, I want to see who are the best sales rep. So we're also tracking the sales rep here. So sales rep and FAP. And as you can see here, Benjamin Button is the best sales rep in FAP. And I can tweak this very quickly and say in March and see like uh, Mary Tyler Moore is coming up very, very quickly. So Benjamin should watch this back. So with Explore, we added for users to get insights out of their data very easily and using natural language processing and machine learning uh, to do that. With that, thank you very much. Back to David.
Thanks, Robert. So that's, that's one of the, the coolest features in G Suite today. That's a great example of artificial intelligence. And we're really just getting started with these features. Again, we want to help companies maximize their creative output, right? We want to democratize access to data. And this is an important stepping stone in that. So let's talk about customers and how they're realizing value from this. So PwC, which is a large global client services firm, migrated to G Suite over the last couple of years. After they had migrated to G Suite, they ran an internal study to look at were their employees actually saving more time. And what they found in these results is that the average employee was saving nine hours per week due to some of these time-saving features in G Suite and collaborative nature of G Suite. That's a lot of time savings. When you think about nine hours over the course of the entire employee base, that adds up. That's more time to focus on higher value activities, such as serving and advising clients. It's really a powerful game changer. So next, let's talk about how we've made uh, G Suite more extensible. So in G Suite, we make it very easy to plug in your own internal workflow or third-party applications or data. We have a set of tools called AppMaker, AppScript, and a set of APIs that allow anyone in your company to easily create applications on top of G Suite, leveraging G Suite data, leveraging third-party data, and making it easy to integrate workflow into the G Suite experience. An example of this is the Gmail add-on framework, which we ad announced earlier this year. This lets you create an application that can plug into Gmail. So you can think of a lot of situations where, for your employees, you want to make it easy on their workflow, such as a salesperson having access to their CRM data plugged into G Suite, right, when they're sending emails to clients and prospects. We're going to continue to invest in this to make it very easy. We want to think of G Suite as a platform that you can build your business on top of. And finally, I want to talk about some of the administrative controls in G Suite. So G Suite, we have a set of administrator features to make you be able to optimize G Suite for your enterprise deployment. Everything from data loss prevention to mobile device management, we make the admin controls very simple and intuitive to use. So that concludes my presentation on G Suite. I hope that gives you an idea of how it can transform the way a company works helping you focus on collaboration, helping your employees be more productive, and helping them maximize their creative output. Earlier today, you heard us talk about optimizing your infrastructure and security. I just spoke about collaboration and how that can change your company's work culture. Next, we're going to talk about Accelerate. We want to talk, and my, my colleague, Brad Calder, is going to come on stage and talk to you about how you can accelerate your business by focusing on what you're uniquely suited for. Brad? Thanks, David. And now I want to talk to you about another reason for using Google Cloud, which is to have a partner that helps you manage your data and drive intelligence from your data better than any other cloud. We want to help accelerate your business to allow you to create software faster, operate faster, and find new insights and opportunities faster than ever before. And given the vast amount of data that's being generated every day, it's a challenge to extract meaning from data. And it's even harder to make critical decisions using it. You shouldn't have to worry about how to configure your databases, or have you, you know, correctly set up your indexes for efficient queries, or how to manage your infrastructure in, in general. Instead, you should let Google Cloud take care of those issues and take care of the infrastructure while you instead focus on finding new insights to drive your business. And nowhere does Google's innovation show up more sharply than in our technology for managing and using your data, both for creating applications and for driving insights. And we make this available to you through Google Cloud's end-to-end -end integrated managed analytics platform. Over the last year, we've been building out our platform's capabilities. And our platform now ranges from storage to data warehousing, ingestion, PI cleaning, ETL, batch and streaming data pipelines, visualization, and machine learning. And it's extended by an ecosystem of partners, including Tableau, Looker, Informatica, Talend, 
and many more advanced data and analytics leading companies. Now, the first thing you need in order to manage your data is a scalable and available database. But databases have always had a fundamental limitation. You either had to pick a relational database that has nice, relational, strong, consistency semantics, but you had to sacrifice scalability. Or you could pick a NoSQL database that scales out horizontally, but you had to sacrifice consistency. And that creates a significant pain and burden for your developers. And we've set out to solve that fundamental problem with our database service, Cloud Spanner. Cloud Spanner is the first and only relational database that scales out horizontally, providing strong consistency at scale. It scales horizontally like a NoSQL database, so it can handle pretty much any transaction load, while still providing the same SQL semantics and relational capabilities and strong consistency of a traditional database. And as an extra bonus, Spanner can be globally distributed without sacrificing consistency, performance, or availability. And on top of that, it's a fully managed service, so it's trivial to administer, and it's battle tested. We use Spanner for hundreds of critical applications inside of Google, including AdWords. And now I'd like to turn it over to Robert, who will give us a look at Cloud Spanner in action. Robert? All right. Hello, everyone, again. So as Fred just mentioned, Cloud Spanner combines the reliability and ease of use of an SQL database with the horizontal scalability of a NoSQL database. But let me show you in, in real, in action. Now, let's start at the beginning, at creating a database. If you want to create a highly scalable and available database, which is set up for failover, uh, you need like replication and charting and things like that. And it's quite a complex task. It involves a lot of configuration, uh, even third party, and things like that. Now, even if you use a managed database ser service, like setting this up for failover and high availability can be quite complex. Now, with Cloud Spanner, we put all this into one screen. As you can see here, I just name the instance. I choose a configuration. In my case, I want to have your REST regional instance. I say how many nodes I want to have. I want to have 10 nodes here, and I click Create. And within seconds, I have a database at my disposal. Now, what be happens behind the scene is that we separate compute and storage. And with this, we enable Cloud Spanner to scale horizontally, but also we set it up for high availability and disaster recovery. But let me show you a little bit more real uh, example. Now, what I have here is a ticket broker application. Now, imagine you are an event organizer and you want to sell tickets, and you have a platform where you basically make these tickets available. You can imagine this, that it's really important that I want to sell each ticket. I don't want to sell a ticket twice. And even worse, I don't want to charge any customer twice. Now, for this, it's obvious that we need like a transactional system. And if this poker, if this platform is globally, then I need something that is globally distributed. Now, to show you that this is just like a relational database, here is the schema for this ticket application that you just saw. So I have a bunch of tables that can be connected and joined together. You see columns in these tables that are strongly typed. Uh, even some of these tables are uh, actually pretty large. So the ticket tables has uh, almost 2 billion rows. But there's no added like, complexity from a uh, NoSQL system. Right? So what you see here is what you basically are familiar with if you have worked with a traditional relational database system. Now, while all this is running, I can still run some queries against this database. So in this query here, I just look at all the events that are happening tonight uh, all over the world, and how many seats are still available for these events. Now, again, what you don't see in here is any added complexity. Now, this query that you see there is just the standard SQL query uh, with some addition for, for Spanner. Now, we understand that your business changes. 
and your application develop. And what you don't want to have is that your business comes to a grinding halt if you need to change the, uh, the schema, for instance. Now, with Cloud Spanner, you have a transactional consistent capability to do online schema changes. So while all your workload is happening, you can change your schema. And if your app grows, if you become really popular, you want to add some capacity. Now, again, with a traditional database system, if you want, need to scale up vertically, you need to procure a new machine. You need to basically fail over to, new, to your new hardware, uh, which usually incurs some downtime. Or if you have a scale-out system, you have the, all this complexity that I talked about in the beginning. Now, with Cloud Spanner, again, we put all this into one screen. So I go to Edit Instance. I choose a new number of nodes, 42 in this case, because this is always the right answer. And I click Save, and within seconds, I have this new capacity at my disposal. Now, let's just recap. With Cloud Spanner, you get a highly reliable, performant, and fully managed database that can be multi-regional with this uh, five-nines of availability. You can have it synchronously, globally replicated. And you get all this interoperability that you know from SQL and asset transactions with advanced features like versioning, um, online schema changes, and strong consistency. So please try Cloud Spanner, and I hope you enjoyed the demo. Thanks. Back to Brad. Thanks. Thanks, Robert, for that great demo. Now, in terms of using data, we see our customers breaking down data silos with the goal of becoming a data-driven company. They want to make it faster and easier for their employees to mine data for insights. And one of the most important services to achieve that is BigQuery. BigQuery is a data warehouse providing fast, interactive analysis of data sets. And those data sets can range from terabytes to petabytes. And you get your results in seconds to minutes instead of hours to days. It allows you to quickly find insights over virtually any amount of data. It uses SQL. It's encrypted, durable, highly available. And its scale and speed are simply amazing. Now, we're seeing our customers use our analytics products in all sorts of ways, but there are three primary use cases. The first is migrating your data warehouse to BigQuery. We've seen hundreds of companies make the move to BigQuery in industries ranging from manufacturing to media to finance and healthcare. And second, we're seeing customers that need help in reducing the cost and complexity of running Hadoop and Spark clusters. So to address this, we provide a data proc service that provides fully managed Hadoop and Spark clusters to easily run your workloads. So this is a great way of reducing the, the cost and hassle of running Hadoop and Spark yourself. And the third use case is we're seeing customers that combine together PubSub plus Dataflow plus BigQuery together to analyzing streaming data sets in real time for applications such as data mining, personalized advertising, and building industrial IoT systems. So as you can see, we're unlocking the power of your data with end-to-end -end integrated managed analytics so you can focus on finding those insights to drive your business. Now, interactive analysis is a great starting point. But to fully take advantage of that sea of data you have, a company needs to leverage AI. And we've been making huge investments in machine learning so that every Google Cloud customer has an on-ramp into AI. And we let you take advantage of artificial intelligence in two ways. First, we're taking the investment in AI that Google is already doing for its own products, like Photos, Translate, and other products, and making those available to you via very simple to use APIs. So you don't have to know anything about artificial intelligence to start adding those capabilities to your applications. Second, we're giving you the tools to build your own models, train them on your own data sets, and run those models on Google's amazing infrastructure or anywhere you want. So let's start with Google's fully trained, pre-built models. 
We have a growing number of models that have already been trained on Google's, with Google with its own domain expertise and data sets. And we've packaged these APIs up so that you can simply just drop them into your application. And these APIs, APIs act like an intelligent component that allows your application to understand speech and photos, translate text, and parse natural languages. And as I mentioned, these are the same models that power many applications inside of Google, such as Google Photos, which allows you to find a picture of almost anything, Google Safe Search, which moderates for inappropriate content, and Google Translate, which uses OCR to extract text in multiple languages. Today, we want to talk to you about one more of these APIs in a bit more detail, the Cloud Video Intelligence API. Now, the most prevalent data on the internet is video. Hundreds of terabytes of digital video are being generated every hour, and understanding the contents of that data has tremendous commercial value. I'm excited to invite Lee on stage to show you the Video Intelligence API in action. Lee? Thank you, Brad. I'm actually very excited today to uh, give this live demo because uh, the Video Intelligence API is one of the APIs that I really, really love. And the reason for that is because I am not a data scientist. I'm a developer. So I can still make use of machine learning and do all these fancy, cool stuff. Um, the way how it works, it's a REST API. So what I do is I can upload a video in a bucket. And then um, the Video Intelligence API will return me a JSON feed with labels of everything that it can see. So then think about landmarks, uh, positions of faces, objects. And it will give that back with a timestamp and also a confidence level. Now let me give you a demo. What you see here is a video of the International Women's Day. And um, when I play it, you see there are lots of different shot changes. Uh, you see here. Um, yeah, all powerful women, you see uh, women in politics, women with sports, um, you see infants, you see all kinds of shots here. Now, imagine that I would be like a company and I would uh, like to categorize this video for, for my website. Uh, then I uh, would have to watch the full video and then I need to write down all the labels of everything that I can see. Uh, now, you can imagine if I would blink my eye, I probably would miss the shot here. And therefore, we let the machine do this. Uh, that's what we did here in this uh, demo. You can see here all the labels that machine, uh, the machine, machine learning intelli video intelligence saw. So for example, I see here a football player. And you see it also returns uh, like a time frame. And there it is. And here's a cartoon. That's pretty amazing, I think. Uh, it's also the other way around. So let's say that I have like petabytes of video data and I, um, yeah, Let's say I write a blog post. And I want to, uh, with my blog post, I would like to show a video. Um, let's say I write a blog post about basketball. Uh, it's really nice that the Video Intelligence API, because it, it labeled everything, that I immediately can find all the vid videos that contain basketball. And to, uh, let me show you a demo of that. So here I have uh, my video application again. And uh, I, I search for basketball. Let me. Um, Search for basketball here. And there you go. You see two videos in my whole uh, full video database that contains basketball. And as you can see, the first video yeah, contains lots of shots about basketball. And you see that it's all on every, key, on every key frame. But I actually also had another video uh, about basketball, which, which was just like one single shot. Let's see if I can go back there. And I would have never known that, that that also contained basketball. So with the Video Intelligence API, it makes it very easy to understand your video library. And with that said, I'd like to hand it over to Brad. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks, Lee. Thanks for the great demo. Of course, that's all great. But what about leveraging your own data sets for artificial intelligence? To achieve this, we give you the ability to train your own data sets using Google Cloud's machine learning engine. Cloud ML Engine helps you train your model using a custom TensorFlow graph for any ML use case using CPUs or GPUs. 
You can easily train your model using TensorFlow, focusing on the creativity of your solution, and leave the infrastructure to us. And when you're done, you can publish those models to make predictions for your application using simple API calls to put that training to use. So TensorFlow is, is an important part of this. So what is TensorFlow? TensorFlow is an open source machine learning library originally developed by Google. And it's used to create and train your machine learning models. And the uptake of TensorFlow has been phenomenal. TensorFlow is the most popular open source machine learning project on GitHub with contributions coming from many companies, not just Google. And in addition to being a powerful framework, TensorFlow was designed to run anywhere. You can run TensorFlow on our Cloud ML engine, as I just described, or you can run them on your own servers in your own data centers, or um, anywhere you want, like mobile devices. Now, in order to accelerate your business, this typically means building applications and continuously improving them to take advantage of your data, the insights you've derived, as well as your machine learning models. This means creating software to make important long-term decisions, as well as, as, well as real-time decisions like what offer to put in front of a customer before they potentially leave your website. Now, for your applications, you want to focus on creating great software, not managing infrastructure. And the key to being able to create great software is to unleash your developers from the burdens of infrastructure. Today, way too much developer time is spent on configuring and managing hardware and software infrastructure. This results in your developers spending their time as operators and not being developers. So at Google, our goal is to allow you to accelerate your software management by making it easy for you to build your applications at global scale without needing to know about or understand the infrastructure details. Because at the end of the day, you want your developers to be writing code, not patching, operating, and scaling infrastructure. And that's what your developers want, too. So in Google Cloud, we enable this by offering you serverless and container solutions at scale with different options to meet your different needs. This is provided by the three services shown here, Container Engine, App Engine, and Cloud Functions. Container Engine is our fully managed Kubernetes as a service. It's the fastest way to take advantage of Kubernetes. It lets you scale Docker containers easily in production. And since Google started Kubernetes, it's no accident that GCP provides the easiest way to run Kubernetes in the cloud. Container Engine uses the same open source Kubernetes code base to orchestrate your application, allowing you to easily leverage the rest of GCP for running your service. And Container Engine handles all the infrastructure details. It schedules and manages your containers automatically, letting you focus on your application. And as a proof point, most of you will probably remember Niantic used Container Engine to launch their blockbuster Pokemon Go game. That game famously scaled to many millions of users across dozens of countries over a period of days. And they reached a capacity in scale that was 50 times, yes, 50 times their pre-launch estimates. So it was quite an amazing launch and product. Now, some application developers don't even want to think about clusters. They want to up-level their focus even a notch higher to what the industry is calling serverless. Serverless means that there is no cluster, no nodes, no pods to think about. All you see when you implement, deploy, and manage your application are application-level constructs. In addition, another benefit of serverless is that when your app application consumes little or no resources when there's zero load, it can then quickly start up and scale out as load demands it. And Google Cloud's App Engine pioneered serverless, empowering applications to scale from serving one request a day to quickly scaling millions of requests per second. And App Engine manages everything on behalf shown here. You just add your application code. And this has really liberated the developers at big companies like Snapchat, 
Home Depot, Philips Lightning, and other companies, allowing them to achieve incredible time to scale, market, and agility. Now, if you actually just want to run some functions in the cloud, we have you covered there with Cloud Functions. With Cloud Functions, a developer can connect, connect existing cloud services or build brand new ones in an entirely serverless way. With Cloud Functions, you only pay for the resources consumed while your functions are running. Billing occurs at the nearest one-tenth of a second. And Cloud Functions can be triggered by a growing list of events generated by GCP services. Essentially, we've designed Cloud Functions so it's easy to extend GCP to fit your business needs. In addition, you can use Cloud Functions from Firebase as well. This makes it very easy for mobile developers to add server-side extensions without having to learn about, configure, or deal with servers. And there are many use cases for Cloud Functions, from the triggering, the triggering of examination of files that have been recently uploaded to your cloud storage, to triggering events that are in your logs, to reacting to actions your users are taking in your applications. OK, and with that, I'm now pleased to introduce Thomas to talk about how Dailymotion is using Google Cloud to improve and accelerate their services. Thomas? Thank you very much, Brad. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. I am uh, Thomas Ashash. I'm the Vice President of Data at uh, Dailymotion. Today, we're going to be speaking of um, Dailymotion, of course, and also about the ways that we use Google Cloud to power our applications and what difference it makes to us. So Dailymotion is one of the leading video platforms in the world. We have uh, 3 billion users, 3 billion uh, views and 300 million users per month on a catalog of uh, 150 million videos. Um, we have offices in five continents, and we are translated in uh, 20 languages. In terms of uh, data, we receive 3.5 billion events per day. Um, but more importantly, recently, we have been through a complete overhaul of our customer experience. Uh, we have redesigned everything from bottom to, uh, to floor. And we have uh, relied heavily on machine learning to do that. Uh, we have, of course, developed uh, classic algorithms for trending videos, popular channels. Uh, but we have also done more special things, like semantic annotation, um, which means that we try not only to understand what objects we recognize in a video, but to understand what the topic of the video is about on an ontology of 25 million topics. So for instance, you can see any video that we have on Bitcoin or Jean Rochefort recently. This is very important to us because it helps us to detect what are the trending topics at the moment. This helps our users to have a topic-based navigation to see more videos on the same topic. And uh, it also helps us to understand better what our users are interested about. Um, we also host uh, the music content of uh, Universal Music. And so we have also put in place neural nets to analyze the music track of uh, our music videos so that they can put them in a representation, a vectorial representation of, uh, of what they contain. And they help us to build smart playlists uh, to help our, uh, our users discover uh, more interesting content that is related to the current clips they're watching. Now, to come back on GCP and how we use it, for us, GCP is really helping us to increase our speed. Obviously, our speed of development, um, but also it helps us building better products because it allows us to have our data available to our algorithms faster. So on the first point, um, on development time, so our apps send 3.5 billion events a day. And we have developed a pipeline that goes through PubSub, Dataflow, and BigQuery in real time. In terms of development speed, 
This took us only two weeks to, uh, to, to, to implement, because we could find on GCP all the basic bricks that allowed us to, uh, to, set, to set it up. But beyond the speed at which we have developed this, what matters even more is that now, whenever we are thinking about a new product, instead of trying to think about, OK, what architecture are we going to use, what stack, what technologies are we going to set up, how are we going to maintain them, the first question we ask is, can we do this with SQL? Because BigQuery is so fast that uh, it can leverage all the amount of data that we send to it in a matter of seconds, and so it's fast enough for most of our production uh, applications. And so with this pipeline, we are able to address issues like how many concurrent users do we have uh, on a given live video? We are able to build very simple recommender algorithms. And we also provide real-time analytics to uh, the partners that upload videos on the platform. And it's uh, really helping us to go faster in our backlog and to release more features for uh, all our users. So having the data available fast can bring marginal improvements uh, for some algorithms like recommendation. For some other algorithms, it is make or break. For instance, we have uh, recently developed a new algorithm to detect fraudulent impressions on the platform. And um, we used to base it on an old Hadoop pipeline that took seven hours for data to be made available to the algorithm. When we switched to the BigQuery real-time pipeline that I just showed, we were able to intercept 10 times more, 10 times more fraudulent impressions because we were more reactive. And so to summarize my message, the acceleration that the cloud provides us is real at Dailymotion. It impacts our development speed and the quality of our products. And so for us, it is an investment in what our customers see. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas. It's great to see the impressive results that you've obtained using our cloud. And now I'd like to introduce Francois, who explain how the cloud is transforming in a historic retail brand. Francois? Thank you. Thank you. Bonjour à tous. Alors avant de parler de, de, de ce qu'on fait avec euh, Google Cloud Platform, je voulais vous, évidemment vous parler un peu de, de, de la redoute. Alors on avait en introduction sur le fait qu'il ne restait plus que 61 entreprises de 1955 dans le top 500 vivantes encore aujourd'hui. Et euh, voilà, nous, nous allons fêter nos, nos 180 ans. Et évidemment, la question, c'est comment on fait pour vivre 180 ans En fait, il faut avoir plusieurs vies. Voilà, c'est ça un peu peut-être le, le début de la réponse. Et la première vie, en fait, de la redoute, euh, voilà, ça a commencé en, en 1837. Voilà, c'était une, une, une filature de laine. Et elle a euh, commencé avec une innovation de l'époque qui était la vente par correspondance. Le chiffre qui m'a toujours impressionné quand je suis arrivé à la redoute, c'est que dans les années 1920, la Redoute avait déjà 325 000 clients en France, ce qui est assez impressionnant. Et euh, ça, c'était la première vie. Et la deuxième vie, au retour de la guerre, c'est euh, celle que sûrement tout le monde connaît, c'est le catalogue, la vente par correspondance. Et ça, ça a été la deuxième vie euh, de, de La Redoute, euh, très, très clairement dans l'accompagnement des Trente Glorieuses. Et ça a été une entreprise qui a été très grande et très profitable, puisqu'elle a eu jusqu'à un moment 10 000 collaborateurs. Le truc un peu marrant que je voulais vous montrer, c'est qu'en 1996, la Redoute se lançait déjà avec son premier site Internet. Mais ça, c'est une bonne expérience, parce que ce n'était pas parce que vous étiez sur Internet en 1996 que ça faisait de vous une Internet compagnie. Et cette société, finalement, elle a failli mourir avant d'être reprise en 2014 par Eric Courtey et Nathalie Bella. Et donc, aujourd'hui, on est dans notre troisième vie. Et euh, si vous voulez... Euh, avoir un KPI qui nous montre qu'on a changé et qu'on s'est transformé. Aujourd'hui, voilà, on fait plus de 90% de notre chiffre d'affaires online. On a un deuxième chiffre qui est aussi important, c'est qu'on a 9 millions de visiteurs uniques, presque 10. Et ça, ça a comparé aux 18 millions de Amazon en France. Alors, c'est beaucoup moins, mais ça nous permet d'exister. Et on va se battre pied à pied pour pouvoir survivre dans ce nouveau monde. Alors, je vais vous parler maintenant de ce qu'on fait avec Google. 
Alors moi, ma mission en tant que Chief Data Officer, voilà, c'est de rendre quelque part la redoute comme une entreprise plus mature autour de la data. Et donc ça, c'est ma mission, c'est ma feuille de route. Euh, la data est un pilier de la transformation de, de la redoute. Et pour mettre des mots derrière ça, voilà, c'est... C'est des use cases, évidemment, et plus généralement, on va dire, développer l'usage de la data dans toute la transversalité de l'entreprise. Désiloter, décloisonner, rendre accessible. Et bien sûr aussi, ça se fait par la technologie, parce qu'il n'y euh, a pas simplement que le cas d'usage, il y a aussi la technologie, il y a aussi une maîtrise qui, qui va avec. Et vous avez euh, derrière moi, là, la, la courbe sur laquelle on a envie d'être, c'est-à-dire de passer un usage très... Euh, descriptif de la data, comprendre ce qui s'est passé, à prédictif, comprendre ce qui va se passer, prescriptif, essayer d'optimiser nos décisions et jusqu'à l'intelligence artificielle qu'on a évoquée ensemble. Et pour faire ça, il a fallu évidemment choisir une plateforme. Et euh, moi, je vais vous donner un peu mon passé. J'avais passé euh, 16 ans chez un opérateur télécom, euh, plutôt en primas, avec nos propres data centers. Et donc, euh, on se posait la question évidemment de la plateforme. Et pourquoi je vous ai parlé de la transformation de la redoute nous, le choix du cloud, au-delà du, du coût, au-delà de la performance, c'était aussi être associé avec un partenaire où la data est dans son ADN. S'il y a bien une société aujourd'hui sur laquelle on peut dire que la, la data est dans son ADN, c'est Google. Et ça, c'était important pour nous d'avoir un partenaire où la data est dans son ADN. La deuxième chose aussi pour nous, c'est qu'on euh, ne voulait pas simplement être un, une direction qui collecte de la donnée pour tout le monde. On voulait aussi développer des applications, on voulait développer euh, des usages autour de ça. Et c'est pour ça aussi que la plateforme, elle n'était pas simplement que les modules data d'un côté, il y avait aussi tout ce qui nous intéressait autour de, des applications et de ce qu'on pouvait héberger. Et le dernier point qui était important pour, pour, pour nous, voilà, euh, nous, euh, on parlait des développeurs, euh, voilà, euh, on ne peut pas ouvrir deux fronts, finalement. Soit vous montez sur le, la technologie, sur le développement, et si en plus il faut que vous montiez un front sur la maintenance, l'infrastructure, ça faisait trop pour nous. Et c'est aussi pour ça qu'on a fait ce choix-là. Donc là, vous avez derrière moi tout ce qu'on utilise aujourd'hui chez Google. Et si vous me demandez alors, 18 mois après, quels sont un peu les résultats, le premier finalement, c'est que c'est devenu le quotidien des gens. C'est-à-dire que tout le monde sait maintenant à la redoute qu'on a mis la data chez Google. Et donc... On ne parle plus de data warehouse, on ne parle plus de data mart, on parle de la data dans Google et c'est vraiment devenu dans le quotidien des gens en termes d'accessibilité. La deuxième chose, en fait, c'est que euh, on a, enfin, ce qui me frappe, moi, depuis 10 mois, c'est la multitude d'usages qu'on a fait. On a monté un Wikipédia de la data avec, on a utilisé euh, dans la prochaine version app mobile de la Redoux, vous aurez la recherche vocale via Cloud Speech API. En fait, euh, euh, ce qui est assez étonnant finalement, c'est que c'est la multitude des usages que l'on a. Et puis le dernier point qui est quand même important pour nous en termes de résultats, c'est l'attractivité. Bon, nous sommes dans le Nord, voilà. Euh, il faut, euh, la redoute n'était pas connue vraiment comme une, une entreprise, on va dire, technologique. Ben, voilà, en faisant ce choix-là aussi, ça nous permet d'attirer les, les talents. Alors je vais finir avec une, un petit jeu de mots. Euh, voilà, c'est ma, ma contribution à la francisation des modules Google. Voilà. Parce que la, le truc qui m'a fait le plus rire euh, cette dernière année, c'est quelqu'un qui est venu me voir. Alors, chez La Redoute, on ne parle pas tous anglais euh, fluent comme Thomas vient de le faire. Il voilà. euh, y a un peu un accent euh, du Nord. Et donc, euh, souvent, là, les, les gens, ils l'appellent plutôt comme ça, en fait. Giggle ou Big Kiri, voilà. Parce que, voilà, j'ai eu quelqu'un qui est venu me voir et qui me dit, euh, on m'a dit que les données étaient dans Giggle Big Kiri. Voilà. Thanks for talk. Right. Thank you. It's amazing to see such a great transformation so quickly using Google Cloud. Okay, and now I'd like to thank you. I've had the privilege of being able to share with you how Google Cloud can accelerate your business by helping effectively manage your data, drive intelligence from your data, add artificial intelligence to your applications, and how to accelerate building and running those applications. And to talk about Google Cloud as a partner, let me call on stage Sam Ramsey, Vice President of Product Management. Sam? Thanks. Thanks. Hello, everyone. I hope you're doing great. It's an honor to be here today. At Google, we believe that customers are looking for something new, a new kind of business relationship, a new suite of technologies, 
a new place to do things in a new way, and a partner with a new approach. Our support of this new kind of partnership starts with openness. I'm going to focus on two things. First, support for what you want to run and for what you have to run. Second, flexible, customer-friendly pricing. It's about putting you in control of your technology. So our customers are telling us that business is demanding more innovation, faster, on a smaller budget. And somehow, IT has to deliver all this. We believe that you can support your existing workloads for less money, allowing you to innovate. So at Google, we've learned that your freedom to innovate requires not having to worry about our costs. That's what we do internally. That's why our innovation velocity is so high. We free developers from worrying about the trappings of infrastructure, as well as simplifying what it's going to cost. So the first step is understanding and planning your migration. We're seeing global CIOs migrating from their data centers to save costs. But there are many benefits beyond cost, better security, better reliability, and access to some amazing innovations that live inside of Google Cloud. Ideally, you want to migrate while changing as little as possible. You want to minimize the change so that you minimize the chance of breaking your applications. Now, later, you'll refactor to use managed services like Cloud Spanner or our machine learning or the DLP APIs. So you want to migrate, then modernize. Our job is to make this easy with both technology and people. So you probably know that Google Cloud is a great place for Linux and open source development. We're making it a great place for Windows developers and IT pros as well. We have support for pre-built images of many versions of Windows Server, as well as SQL Server. We also support Active Directory in the cloud so that you can extend your on-premises Active Directory domain controllers. For developers, our goal is to meet them where they are without requiring significant change. So you can use Visual Studio to deploy .NET applications and manage cloud resources. We've also created hundreds of PowerShell commandlets in the Cloud SDK for administrating your cloud projects. To help with your journey, we also have an amazing set of engineers. When I think about Google Cloud, I think about our engineer-to-engineer -engineer relationship. First, our sales engineers and our solution architects will help you understand Google Cloud and get quickly get on to getting your applications deployed. Our support teams are backed by our product engineering organization in case you need help. Olku Rowe talked to you earlier. She's from the office of the CTO. They work directly with customers who are taking on massive efforts that require industry expertise in areas like manufacturing, energy, healthcare, or financial services. We have customer reliability engineers who use Google's best practices for creating billion user scale applications and keeping them running, like Gmail, search, and ads. They'll help your team ensure reliability, even in the most extreme conditions. And because we participate directly in open source communities, we can often help you with your questions or your issues in deploying open source stacks, whether on premises or in Google Cloud. So this is how we helped Evernote migrate their entire software infrastructure from on-premises to Google Cloud in just 89 days. So you might ask, what's the best test for minimal friction when migrating? I think the best test is zero downtime. It may sound impossible, but we did it working closely with Evernote, working engineer to engineer. 200 million of their customers moved to Google Cloud with no change in service and no downtime. Lush is another great example. In 22 days, we moved 17 websites and applications, including core databases. Users, orders, products, and content. These are mission critical. They move databases with sizes ranging from a few gigabytes to 100 gigabytes to Google Cloud. And our engineer-to-engineer -engineer approach made the migration process fast and predictable. You dump data into cloud storage and restore it into Cloud SQL. You shift from a vertical scaling to a horizontal scaling architecture. To get there, let's talk about costs. So clouds are supposed to be elastic and free you from CapEx and from capacity planning. Now, some cloud providers force you to pay upfront for a three-year commitment in order to get the best price. But if you have to buy a virtual machine for three years, how is that actually better than buying your own server for three years? We think it's not. A recent State of the Cloud report showed that cloud users waste 45% of their bill on resources that they don't use. Now, that waste is caused by many factors. First, three-year leases force you to predict your future perfectly. And really, none of us are capable of doing that. So you end up with stranded resources. 
Second, just like with on-premises servers, you're forced to buy fixed machine configurations with particular amounts of RAM, storage, uh, and uh, CPU. So you end up paying for a machine over time that is too big for you in some dimensions and too small in others. And you pay for the full hour, even if your test only takes 10 minutes. So you're paying for compute time that you're not using. This all adds up to 45% unnecessary expenditure. We think that there's a better and cheaper way to run your cloud. We believe that we've solved all three of these sources of waste, in fact. So first, automatic sustained use discounts that are applied to give you savings without any long-term agreement. As soon as you use a VM for more than a week, you will see savings. If you use a VM for an entire month, you will get a 30% discount. But you're still free to stop using that VM at any time. Sustained use discounts, as we like to say, bring the cloud back into cloud. Change your mind at any time and still get great prices. It should be on demand. Second, you don't need to accept fixed machine configurations. Uh, as we say, why would you want to have only virtual machines whose shape comes in powers of two? With other providers, if your applications need 20 cores and maybe 50 gigs of RAM, you might have to buy a 40 core, 160 gigabyte machine. You could literally be paying for more than double the resources you need. But with Google, custom machines let you dial in exactly the configuration you need. You pay for exactly the resources that you use. These are so popular that over 20% of all the core hours operating on Google Cloud are custom machines. They're so popular, what we decided to do was help you save more money with our right-sizing recommendations. So we apply ML algorithms internally and prompt you with alerts where we think that you could save money because your mean and even your peak utilization of that machine is lower than what you've specified for the machine. So we try to suggest the best virtual machine size to proactively save you money. So finally, and this is pretty exciting, pay only for what you use by the second. So Google is the first to offer per second billing for all services. If you use a VM for 90 seconds, you pay for 90 seconds. This is available and active in Google Cloud today, right now. So Google Cloud is elastic. You only buy what you need, only when you use it, and you automatically get discounts for sustained usage. We think this makes it much more simple for you. We even alert you when you appear to be wasting resources. When you put all of this together, we save our customers on an average 60% relative to what they pay on other clouds. With that, it's my great pleasure to introduce Christophe Defeye from Amadeus to talk about his experience of this new kind of relationship. Christophe. Great. Thank you, Sam. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you. A lot of what Sam mentioned resonates to me because we, we do use many of the features uh, he mentioned. So now let's transition smoothly back to French. My slides will be in English, but je vais parler français. <laughs> vous, connaissez, vous, vous connaissez certainement uh, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, le virtuose de la musique, mais connaissez-vous Amadeus, le virtuose du cloud pour l'industrie du travel non Alors, Je vais vous expliquer. Amadeus est le leader mondial de l'industrie du travel. Depuis 30 ans, nous servons les compagnies aériennes, les hôtels, les agences de voyage afin de délivrer les meilleurs services aux voyageurs, donc à vous. Laissez-moi vous expliquer tout ça. Vous connaissez Amadeus peut-être parce que vous l'avez utilisé dans nos services tous les jours. Que vous, quand vous prenez l'avion, quand vous réservez un billet, quand vous cherchez un voyage ou quand vous embarquez. L'année dernière, nous avons embarqué plus d'un milliard de passagers dans les avions du monde entier. Ça représente plus de 40 passagers par seconde, imaginez. En même temps, nous recevons toutes les réservations de ces billets d'avion. Ça représente plus de 600 millions de, de billets l'année dernière, ce qui fait un pic de transactions de 4 millions par jour. Pour pouvoir recevoir ce trafic, on reçoit des, 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 des queries de, des utilisateurs qui représentent plus de 55 000 transactions par seconde en moyenne, ce qui est à peu près la même taille de requête que reçoit Google Search. Et bien sûr, tous nos logiciels doivent être scalable, résilients à la, à la faute, et on fait ça avec des investissements massifs dans la R&D, 4 millions depuis 2014, 5 000 développeurs dans le monde, et bien sûr, notre présence dans 190 pays. Imaginez 190 pays, 
c'est quasiment deux fois la présence de McDonald's dans le monde. Mais pourquoi Amadou a-t-il investi dans le cloud En fait, les habitudes des voyageurs ont changé ces 15 dernières années. Avant, on allait dans une agence de voyage pour pouvoir réserver un billet. Nos désirs de voyage, nos dates, notre budget, notre destination, tout était déjà fixé dans nos têtes. Et quand on arrivait, on n'avait plus qu'à finaliser notre dossier avec l'agent de voyage. Mais maintenant, on prend son temps, tout est différent. Cet été, j'ai voulu emmener ma femme à Prague et j'ai fait des recherches sur pas moins de 10 sites web avant de me décider à réserver un billet d'avion. En effet, maintenant, on cherche sur son ordinateur, sur sa tablette, sur son mobile. Et en plus de ça, on n'est pas très patient, donc on a envie d'avoir des réponses très très rapides. Vous imaginez le stress que ça met sur les systèmes des inventaires des compagnies aériennes. Il y a quelques années encore, le ratio de conversion entre une recherche et une réservation était de 10 pour 1. Aujourd'hui, il est de plus de 1000 pour 1, et ce nombre ne fait qu'augmenter tous les ans. C'est pour ça que tous nos logiciels doivent être vraiment capables de tenir une charge, une charge quasiment infinie, puisqu'elle croît tous les ans, et donc euh, être capable de, de consommer de plus en plus d'infrastructures. C'est pour ça qu'on s'est dit qu'une solution basé sur le cloud, était, devenait indispensable. Donc depuis 2013, Amadou a investi massivement dans une solution de plateforme de service qui s'appelle Amadou Cloud Services, et aussi à l'adaptation, donc Amadou Cloud Services, pardon, qui est basé sur Docker, Kubernetes, OpenShift, et aussi à l'adaptation de notre application de calcul de disponibilité, Amadou Cloud Availability. Ça si, on a réussi à porter cette application dans le, dans, le, dans le cloud, euh, avec une scalability infinie, en étant capable de répondre à la demande des, euh, des, des, des voyageurs, tout en leur donnant une précision qui est quasiment de 100% égale à celle qu'on aurait en attaquant directement un inventaire central d'une compagnie aérienne. Aujourd'hui, un de nos déploiements principaux utilise Google Cloud Platform. Il est réparti sur trois régions, Europe, Asie, Europe, euh, pardon, Europe, Asie, Amérique, ce qui permet d'avoir des temps de latence les minimums. Et euh, on a 2000 VCPU de déployés. Bien sûr, ce qui est intéressant, c'est qu'avec une plateforme comme ça, il ne nous faut que quelques minutes pour pouvoir augmenter la capacité ou la réduire en fonction de la demande. Mais comment Google a réussi à, à nous aider dans cette démarche euh, Je dirais principalement trois choses. Premièrement, on a été un des premiers à utiliser les Preemptible VM en production. Euh, en combinant l'usage des Promptible VM avec des virtual machines standards, on a réussi, sur le déploiement euh, JCP, à optimiser nos coûts et à les réduire de 50% environ. D'autre part, la, la plateforme nous permet de, de gérer vraiment dynamiquement la capacité. Alors que ce soit en utilisant des Managed Instance Group, par exemple de Google, où on définit le nombre d'instances qu'on a besoin, et euh, euh, quand, Google, quand une virtual machine crash, Google nous redonne une virtual machine exactement identique ou alors en utilisant Kubernetes pour le déploiement de nos applications. Euh, Kubernetes qui est euh, un, un projet open source dans lequel Amadeus contribue fortement euh, upstream. Et enfin, les performances de la plateforme euh, sont au rendez-vous, que ce soit grâce aux optimisations que nous faisons dans nos propres algorithmes, ou aux nouveaux déploiements d'infrastructures que Google fait, comme euh, les récents déploiements euh, des architectures Skylake d'Intel, euh, qui ont amélioré les performances. Alors finalement, depuis 18 mois, on est en production, la plateforme est extrêmement stable, que ce soit grâce euh, à la stabilité de l'infrastructure ou à la, faute, la résistance aux pannes de l'application. Voilà, vous avez un petit aperçu de notre euh, voyage dans le cloud, euh, mais ce n'est que le début et euh, le voyage est encore à écrire. Merci beaucoup. Merci. So to close out the morning, uh, let me invite Sébastien Marotte to come back to stage. Merci, merci beaucoup, merci de votre attention. Donc c'est la clôture de Skinote. Une fois encore, merci de votre attention. Un merci, un remerciement particulier pour euh, nos clients, François, Thomas et Christophe, pour vos euh, partages d'expérience. Ça compte, c'est très important le partage d'expérience parce qu'évidemment c'est quelque chose qui est assez nouveau, comme Amadeus a dit, c'est un voyage. 
Et, euh, et on a besoin de retours d'expérience, on a besoin de cas d'usage. On est vraiment piloté par les cas d'usage. Je crois que le, le maître mot, c'est si vous n'avez pas démarré ce voyage, il est temps de vous y mettre. On est là, on est là pour vous aider. Et on a organisé la suite de cette journée autour d'ateliers. Et ce que je souhaite vraiment, c'est que vous profitiez au maximum de ces ateliers techniques, des conversations techniques qu'on va avoir avec nos experts, et surtout donc des présentations produits. Et une fois encore, des retours d'expérience, parce qu'on en aura d'autres. On va surtout attacher beaucoup de temps et d'importance sur ces cas d'usage cet après-midi. Voilà, je vous souhaite une excellente journée. Merci de votre attention.